Welcome everyone to another episode of Dissolving the Divide, where we are endeavoring to have hard conversations about subjects that divide people, that create division within us and between us, and we hope to dissolve this divide to bring peace and harmony um, to our planet. And we have a wonderful guest today named Dan Arnold, and I, I'm going to introduce, uh, let Derek introduce him. And I'm Leslie Powers, and this is Derek Bartolicelli. Well, bonjour, bonjour. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. This is a really interesting episode uh, with a really, really interesting uh, gentleman, mm, thank Daniel. You. Yeah, and uh, you might have seen him uh, during his coffee rants or maybe, you know, some tactical chats, which he terms uh, tact chats. He's been doing that, that series for, for a while now, and... Uh, I came across this brother through uh, Corey Andrelet's uh, uh, End of Slavery Summit, which Leslie and I were both on as well. And yeah, he had such an incredible story to tell of you know his time uh, with the, the police force. Uh, I think you were on the SWAT team as well and uh, Marines. Yeah. So yeah, I'm gonna pass it off to you and, and explain all that real briefly as we try to dissolve this interesting divide of yeah, this oh, man-made authority and the police state that's enforcing it yeah. as opposed to, you know, the laws of nature and just, you know, you know, eternal principles that are, that everyone can kind of come together and, and understand and be unified under these common universal laws. But, uh, yeah, yeah I, I how think, you doing, uh, <laughs> good, man. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I think, uh, the divide is a, is a very good way to start it because, um, as a as a law enforcement officer, not so much when I was in the Marine Corps because I was younger, but as uh, and, I, and I've seen a lot of military people get very dis, disenchanted and become, you know, anarchists. But there's not many cops that become anarchists. Uh, so I, I might be an oddity in that. I mean, there's probably a few. But uh, the divide is within yourself when you're in law enforcement. Um, if you have any type. And, and I know a lot of good guys out there, cops on the departments now that were, you know, they're they're besides the job they're doing they're they're good people and they hate the job they can't wait they're counting the days to get the hell out of that job so you know i i when i'm you know sending messages to my fellow ex order followers i'm not like i'm trying to do an outreach to them and I, you guys probably heard of the german you know night of long knives right where they had to get rid of all the the grace the the police that were in place in germany because they wouldn't do you know what they you know they got replaced with the ss well i think that's going to happen in this country eventually because there's too many police that are not wanting to do these extreme things um and i think the divide for for most people for me and i can see it everywhere the divide comes within the contradiction that you find in it and um we accept these contradictions but you end up being at war with yourself over them so like uh there's a reason why you know cops and military end up having so many you know unhealthy coping mechanisms because you just ain't jiving with the reality that you're in so you want to find this way to to you know live in the moment and you end up doing it in an unhealthy way and then when it comes to you know cops and military i think we get so caught in the r complex of our brain that we just stay there so you, you can really develop really, you know, bad, unhealthy coping mechanisms which I talked about in Rise from Darkness. Who are they? Um, but, the, you know, the biggest thing with uh, being an order follower is the contradictions you're going to face within your own department, the people you're going to be fighting with, with your, in your own department. It is one of the nastiest, dirtiest jobs I've ever been in. I've been in a lot of them. So, you know, when they say the blue wall of silence, that's complete bullshit. There's more backstabbing in police work than I've ever seen ever. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, really, it is. Everyone's fighting each other for like what well, department I was on. It was the federal facility I was at. Um, it was like a big Game of Thrones. Everyone was trying to get promoted. You know, take less orders, I guess. Hey, Dan, get, can you share some concrete examples of some of the contradictions, you know, that um, law enforcement will face on a daily basis, the kind of dilemmas? Yeah, well, system? the big the big one I could tell you with me was is they would try and tell you who to enforce what laws with and who not to, oh. okay? Situational law enforcement. And it happened on, on you know, the, the small federal level that I was on, uh, even though it's not wasn't really all that small, but 
you could see it being done. You can see the FBI being weaponized. So what they're doing is that the contradictions is they weaponize you. And then when you try to do an investigation into something like patient neglect, uh, you know, like where I was at, you try and do a, uh, an investigation into just basically stuff like that. You're getting slapped down. They don't want you to do that. You know, just just do what we tell you to do. Just yeah, follow these orders. Are, sorry, on this, you know, grand chessboard that they're playing on, you know, that's right. their game. And, you know, the order followers are, you know, pieces on the chessboard that they feel like they can move around uh, to their will or whatever, you know. I was a terrible order follower. I was terrible. I mean, I was just not good at it at all. But, oh, <laughs> I man, didn't follow good. orders. I didn't get in trouble, but I didn't follow orders um, very well. Um, but you're a good author, and which I forgot to mention real quick. I'm sorry. In the introduction, you've written several books. And, yeah, I wrote two, uh, Violence and Ego. Actually, I got here. I got pictures. I got, oh, yeah, I got them. right here. Violence and Ego, which was a catharsis of... Um, my career in law enforcement, I wrote in 2016. It's got a lot of good self-defense information in there and how your ego will sometimes get you into problems. You know, your mouth will get you into problems that you're behind can't cash mm -hmm. and how to avoid that kind of thing, you know, because uh, I was extra good at talking people down in police work. I didn't want to have to fight with people. And then this is Rise from Darkness. Who are they? And it's funny. That's my daughter's artwork. And it's only 190 DPI. And I wanted it to look like that. And this is the book that I talked about uh, from spiritual bankruptcy to spiritually awakened. And the funny thing about this book is I talk about my unhealthy coping mechanisms. And when I first started writing in 2018, uh, it was actually, yeah, August 5th, 2018. I, I penned the first words and five crows flew by. I could keep getting these, all these shamanic, like spirit animals, you know, totems and stuff. Um, and I'm like, wow, I'm supposed to do this. Well, two years later, <laughs> I had only written like 19,000 words. And then the PSYOP broke out. And between May and June, I took it from 19,000 up to 57,000. And I got a lot more exact. Like I was going to just take my unhealthy coping mechanisms and talk about how I got over them in a generic way without getting real exact. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, well, you know, I think I need to get exact. You know, like I had a pornography addiction. I needed to put that out on the street uh, for two reasons. One, you know, you want to certain addictions. I had to do this, all this research on myself. I, I could get no help around here. None. That's a whole story within itself. Um, but I had to put that on the street because Sun Tzu's Art of War says, if you're going to be talking out against certain entities, you, if you got any trash, put it out there. Then they can't use it against you later. So I was like, let me get exact on this. Even though, you know, I think they over do addictions. I'm going to, my next podcast, I'm going to, I'm going to get into addictions. You know, they, they want to say there's process addictions, there's chemical addictions. And I say both are both. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's a there's a chemical component to any process addiction, and there's a process to any chemical you know addiction. So I, I had to do all this research and find out for myself. You know, I couldn't go get help because wow. the, the system I was in around here were using uh, psychologists and people in mental health against me, and I didn't trust them. I've seen too many things where they worked PRN. And people knew people. And I was just like, okay, I'll do this myself. I'm cool. Right. Um, and my, my last podcast that I just did, Tax Chat 48, I unpacked like an hour's worth, like the first, like just breaking the ice about Rise from Darkness, who are they, and, and started off how it all happened. So, guys, you get a chance, go check that out. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the, the contradictions you have on the job, you're, they're, they're going to eternally tear apart at you. And you take this oath, like I took this oath, and the only thing that we pay attention to, even the cops who end up getting bad shabby and turning into bad cops, you, you, they, they still got this fantasy of protect and serve in mm -hmm. their head. And, and that's kind of what I stuck with, the protect and serve. And, you know, you're not going to do any of that other stuff that they're talking about and enforce whatever laws and blah, 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 blah. Well, no, you know, you want to serve something greater than yourself. And I end up I was serving something greater than myself, but it, it wasn't good. Right. And that was a hard pill for me to swallow. Right. Um, so there's there's this moral relativism within the force. So mo the average always. person is thinking, oh, laws are, you, you know, something we all need to follow, do the right thing. And they're expecting that laws are applied equally. Right. But the reality you're saying is that those laws are not applied equally. No. That some people get um, 
you know, the get to do what they want and, and pe- the law enforcement turns a blind eye and other right. people are being targeted. Is there a socioeconomic um, difference and who, who gets in, uh, in trouble? And from, gets- from what I've seen, it's, uh, well, of course, there can be some racial components to it, but it's not as racial as some people think. That's part of the mind control divide. They're using race as a dialectic to, that's way worse than it actually is. Race wasn't even invented till like 1858 and no one paid attention. I mean, everyone knew we were from separate countries and stuff, but they're, they're making that into a dialectic just to divide us in any way they can. I talk about that in the book too. They're using gender, they're using everything. Um, but it, they, I mean, there's a little bit of that, but it, it is economic because I think they've monetized the entire criminal justice system. I worked in a prison and if you have a good lawyer, you might not you know, go to prison. If you did, had a public defender, have fun. So it is a monetized system, mm-hmm. um, and it's not only social economic. I think sometimes it's status, mm-hmm. which would be mm-hmm. the social part, I guess, because there's certain people that they didn't want us to do investigations on, or you couldn't write a ticket to. Um, but you can for these other people on these other things. So, yeah. like, you got a whole book. I forgot what title it is already. It's been so long since I worked in it, but it's it's a federal title. Oh, God, what's the criminal title? I'm not making myself look good here. Cut this part out. No, I'm joking. You can leave it in. <laughs> um, no, but but you got this whole criminal. You got this whole federal criminal code that you you know have supposedly the statutory authority to enforce, and then they tell you you got this discretion on what to enforce and what not to enforce. Right? I gave a lot of breaks because of that discretion. I wasn't messing around with victimless crimes. Even back then, I was kind of enforcing natural law because I only went. I only put two people in prison my whole career, and they were sex offenders. Everyone else got breaks. I wrote a few tickets in the beginning. I made this lady cry. And if you excuse my language, I won't swear very often on here. But after she, after that time, when she cried, I was like, fuck this. I'm not doing this again. I felt like crap. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm not making money for the city. I'm not making money for, for the system. That's not what I'm here for. I'm supposed to be here to protect and serve, right? Peacekeeper. So you got all these ideas in your head and what you want to be. But then they're constant. And then they'll tell you and the public that that's what you are. But behind the scenes, they're not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Behind the scenes, I mean, any cop that's honest will get up and tell you how how much system, how much bullshit's in the system. Um, Jeez, certain criminals, what's that? No, I was just going to say you brought up a really good point, and maybe you can like delve into this a little bit more, just because you know, for me on the outside looking in, and I've been in the prison system a couple of times, and it just seems like once they get you in there, it's like ah, gotcha, and, and it's really hard to get out, and, and these things like linger on, and you know. Yeah having to pay whatever a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. So, and yeah, in California, uh, I realized growing up in the, in the nineties, eighties and all that stuff that, and this was talked about in certain, you know, hip hop songs growing up and stuff that were, you know, keen on, you know, what the hell was going on in, in a sense. And just, right. they noticed that there's more prisons being built than actual like schools, for example, even though yeah. in camp, whatever, was a prison you know, anyway, but yeah, things, but yeah, it's just a, you know, it, yeah, like you said, it's this like mon- monetized, you know, thing. So it's like they have to make money and they have to make money off of people. And like officers have a quota that, that they have to meet at the end of a month. Like that's complete, completely fucked up in society. Like it's uh, it's an unwritten thing in, in a lot of departments. It's unwritten, but you're oh, told yeah. you're pressured that they want you to do it. And I never did it. In fact, there'd mm-hmm. be this one guy. He's like, yeah, I got 14 of them today. You know, blah, 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 speeders. And I'm like, dude, why are you being a road Nazi? And why are you telling me? Because I'm going to go 25 miles per hour over the speed limit on the way home. Like, I don't, why you do it? I, mean, like, I never got into that. Um, so there's a little leeway for people. Oh, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of leeway that cops can use, um, right. especially on the minor misdemeanors. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I always joked around as I didn't want to be a Mr. Meaner cop. <laughs> so that's why I wouldn't give out those types of tickets. I just didn't want to do it. Um, Are there quotas? That's kind of the word that I hear. There's quotas. Oh, like, yes, there is. Not officially. Is there, any, is there competition in a way? Like who? Who? Uh, who they'll have it? little competitions here and there. Whoever writes the most tickets in this month, blah 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 blah. And they used to have stuff that was really bad. Like I'm talking back in the '90s. I it, it, towards the like it, you know 2013 ish, 14 ish. I it wasn't really so much then, but. Um, You'd write X amount of tickets. It would help. It would help for the the city party or the FOP party or whatever. You'd get. You know, they'd get these little. It's the most minor thing that goes on in law enforcement that's wrong with it, but it's still wrong. 
You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's like the prison system. Um, I've seen guys who, like, if I ever caught a case and went to prison, just put me in population. I don't care if they all know I'm a cop. Let me get into a fight or two. And then people leave me alone and I'll be around other human beings. I've seen people that got put into protective custody, got, you know, they got put in a hole and or segregation unit, they used to call it. It's the most inhuman thing you can do is to isolate somebody like that. I yeah. mean, it's it's bad. Like you shouldn't be in prison unless you actually m murdered somebody. And then I think in a real anarchist society, you know, in a free, higher spiritual society, if you did something that was that horrendous, you get put out of the village, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And anything else you could be rehabbed on. You know, I know they got villages where if you mess up and this is like over, I don't, know, I don't quote me on which villages, but I, I, I seen, I read someplace where instead of like punishing somebody because they made a mistake, they messed up, the village would all get around them and tell them all the good stuff they did. And then, hey, don't do that again. Mm -hmm. So instead of shaming somebody, it's reminding them, hey, we're all human. You, you, you effed up a little bit. So let's not do that again. And I, I kind of dig that idea. I can, I kind of picture a spiritual anarchist society being like that, mm -hmm. as opposed to this monetized prison system where so many people, like you don't, Derek, you, honestly, you don't seem like the type of guy that would go to prison for anything to me. I sold weed and stole a bike. And how about that shit? Petty theft, but it, <laughs> it, they bumped it up to grand theft. Uh, really? Rapid, uh, yeah. Like a shitty bike back in like, you know, early two thousands before electric bikes. Right. They value the bike over like a, whatever umpteen amount of hundreds or a thousand, whatever. And it goes over 500 to make it grand theft. That's what turns it into a felony. In most places. I don't know what California laws are. I hear they're really bad there compared to other places, but I see. That's another thing. I seen a lot of people doing time for weed, for dealing weed, for smoking weed. And I'm just like, man, that sucks. Like I, I would talk to the guys and like I smoked so much weed when I was a teenager. I, I feel bad for you, you know, and then you're there. These guys are in there. And I had, you know, I, I got more prison stories in five years of working in a prison than I have in over 20 years of being a cop for various places. Um, you know, I, I seen guys that were in there for smoking weed or dealing weed, even if it was their second or third time or whatever, dealing a green leaf, sitting next to a guy like Dr. Lecter. Cause I worked in a closed maximum. I worked in a closed maximum uh reception center so they all came through us and then they'd get class to go where they go i had a guy who literally ate people mm. in my pod he wasn't supposed to actually get to regular population but he accidentally did he was in my pod uh all five foot three of him so all these big huge inmates you gotta pick these big six foot five built you know black dudes who's been bitten their whole life they've been in the system running up he's scared as hell about this dude who eats people and I'm like, no way. And they're like, dude, look at, and they show me the newspaper. And sure enough, they're bringing him out of the newspaper, locked up like Dr. Lecter, face mask and everything. And he's sitting in my pod, five foot three. And Damn. so, you know, I, well, I wouldn't have a nice talk with him, you know, for his own safety, he stay right there in front of me. We don't move. Don't do nothing. I mean, what else was I going to do? You know, my job in there. And I had a lot of inmates like my pod because I would keep them safe. You know, I, I would run the pot in a way where I was, you know, firm, fair and consistent. But a lot of them liked how I did it because I keep them safe because a lot of the inmates in there, prisoners, a lot of people. OK, let me quit referring to them, anything other than they are. A lot of people in there aren't in there for bad things and they need protection from the ones who are. Yeah. And there are some really bad people in those places. I just don't yeah. think somebody doing, you know, selling weed. What kind of education is that guy getting? Right. I was going to ask oh, you, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, the prison, they, it kind of creates criminals. Let's just be honest, you know, like you it's know, a criminal, it's criminal college. Yeah. They get yeah that's what I was going to ask a little bit more about the impact on these sort of nonviolent, you know, no, um, no victim criminals, right. What they're called yeah. criminals. Um, on, what is the impact of being in prison on them? Well, I can tell you the impact from a, from, from my standpoint of looking at it, I know in my life, in the, in the contradictions and in the, uh, you know, that inward struggle that you have with a lot of things or, or you get done unfairly by, by somebody, you end up having this like uh, amount of resentment, right? Mm -hmm. So the big thing that I seen from these guys is, is they're in there and they, have, they end up growing a lot of resentment. Yeah. So then they're going to get out. I'm no psychologist or nothing, but they're going to get out and have antisocial, you know, 
issues. They're, they're not going to like people. They're going to, they're not going to be able to get a job. So the, I mean, society then shuns them and they're not even in there from anything bad. And they turn into these really bad people. Um, and it's not even their fault. I mean, although Background I do see some guys, that- you know, what alone, uh, about just to rent a room sometimes. Oh, if you have any oh, criminal record, you know, background yeah. for fucking everything. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. you know, it, it, it can really ruin people's lives. And, and what will get you angry. And, and this is why I think a lot of the work being done by everyone in the one great work network and by Mark Passio and, um, is understanding objective morality because these people weren't doing nothing immoral. And that's the biggest thing that I would try to get through to, you know, my ex former order followers is, we're not going to instantly be able to get rid of all order followers. So this isn't going to happen overnight, but use your discretion and don't a don't follow immoral or orders and b use discretion and don't mess with anybody. If it's a victimless crime, because smoking weed or anything you put in your body is not a crime. It's your body. You own it, you know? Um, yeah. So like I'm was never like big on busting drug people. I just, I just wasn't. And when I wanted to go after some drug people that were selling heroin and people were ODing, they wouldn't let me. Huh, really? So um, I just wanted to keep people from ODing in the area that I was in. I, I don't even think looking back on it, knowing what I know now that I would have had a right to do that because that's two people engaging in whatever two grownups agree to engage in. The risk is yours. Right. So like, and thinking back on it in my mind, I was thinking, Hey, I'm going to help these keep these because we had like four or five people that OD'd or, and died. So I, I thought I was going to do some good, but thinking back on, I'm glad I didn't. I'm kind of glad they didn't let me do it. But the reason they didn't let me do it wasn't because of objective morality because it would make their place look bad. Right. So um, yeah, there's that. And that's the kind of stuff that definitely still aggravates me a little bit. Are there consequences to the, the officers who um, don't do what they're told? You know, what, is there a threat of consequence? Uh, well, it, it's, it depends. Like some of the consequences are just, you're going to get like, I, I, when I would get my um, employee evaluations, there's only two areas I would score excellent on and everything else would be like, you're just barely making it, dude. You're just barely making it. So I was like, just barely making it on everything else, but I was good with public relations and I was good with training. I was a training officer. So of course I was going to be good with that. Um, everything else you barely make it. So you're not getting these stellar marks that are going to help with a promotion or anything else, you, you know, so it can affect you in that way. They can't legally, they can cause all kinds of problems for you and they do, but there's not a lot they can do legally. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you're not gonna, but then like me, I was in a situation where I got hurt and they didn't have to help me neither. I had a very contentious workers comp claim because of it. Right. Um, and, and I, you know, I talk about that in the book. I mean, that's not, a, that happens everywhere, to be honest with you. And when you work on a law enforcement department, I can tell you law enforcement people out there, they probably know this or they've been hurt. They automatically open up two investigations on you. The first one's going to be the administrative investigation. The second one's going to automatically be a criminal fraud investigation. Because now you've got certain law enforcement abilities that are doing the investigation that can have access to things that the administrative side can't. Then the administrative side can totally shit all over your Fourth Amendment rights because you they're not the police. So it's sort of like Facebook is privately owned, but also being used by it. it that's what they do. If they do this, it's fractal. It's like they do the same stuff everywhere. So like when I, I'm not joking when I say since March of 2020, I've been triggered. Um, every time I turn something on and see some new psyop, I know exactly what they're, I'm probably only been wrong like 2% of the time. Mm -hmm. And I would like to be wrong all the time as far as all this stuff's concerned. Mm -hmm. I'd love to be wrong, mm -hmm. but I'm what, seeing, go ahead, did, I'm sorry. What did you see in your, your career that then informed you about what's happening as far as a PSYOP with like 2020 forward? Well, I underwent, they, I underwent PSYOPs myself. They followed me around. Uh, I was basically gang stalked. They followed me at gyms. They still follow me at gyms once in a while. I'll, I'll be looking into a bottle and there's a camera in it. Wow. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm talking real cloak and dagger stuff here. And I went into all that in my book, Rise from Darkness, on different things that I, they tried to intimidate me. Um, they What they try to do is they, they'll, when they're doing these psyops, they'll sensitize you to their presence because they want to watch how you act. They're wanting to drive you nuts. They're wanting to drive you crazy. 
I mean, they kept cars parked on my street with cameras in them because I was making them out too fast. I was I was considered what they would consider a um, sophisticated target because of my line of work and some of the stuff I did in my line of work. So there was times they probably had up to 10 people on me. Was this and, after you left or while you were still well, in? Yeah, this is after I left and while I was still there partially when I got hurt. Uh, and I didn't realize it was going on at first. Um, that's kind of funny. But uh, I, I mean, that kind of stuff and how they turn on their own and they'll eat their own really fast. That's what I would tell any cop out there. They'll eat you fast. As soon as, as, soon as it's going to, anything's going to happen to make them look bad in any way or whatever, you're going to cost them, you know. And it's funny how they do it. There's a whole system based on workers' comp fraud. And I wasn't fraudulent. I have my embarrassing injury on video doing <laughs> nothing heroic, but I was legitimately hurt. And um, it was a bike crash. And like I said, it's embarrassing on, on video. Um, and the doc, I was going to get my treatment through the facility. The doctor misdiagnosed me. And he also, if I found out later, his license had lapsed. So he, was not, he wasn't even licensed to be doing medicine. And once that happened, they formed the wagons. And I couldn't understand why they formed them like that. Why they got so, um, you know, divisive with me especially when I was just doing, you know, what I was told to do. I was, I was going to go do, and when I seen all that, I was like, uh Oh, something's going on. And I found out all this stuff later. So like they would rather have ruined my life than to take a chance on me suing them for a misdiagnosis. And then I ended up retiring later on early anyway, with a partial disability partial. Um, so it's kind of funny because it's like, uh, I had to, I think I paid the, uh, the negative consequential effects of my job in, in many different ways. And they kind of did too on what they did because I ended up, you know, what they were afraid of is what I ended up doing. Leaving. Right. So, so there, there was a deterrent to um, like outing the corruption. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah, there's, there, there is. It, well, the fact is that some people will try to out the corrupt. If they're that deep state war, it goes on in inner cities. It goes on in these different places, you know, um, you know, like I got a, a, a guy that I know I was going to have him on my podcast. He, me and him worked together at one point in time and uh, he had to go sit on an inmate and his inmate was on his deathbed. The inmate was from New York. The inmate was, uh, I'll just say, highly connected with certain criminal organizations. He was given a deathbed confession and, you know, he, you know, this is like the summer of 2001. He was like, oh yeah, and they're going to be running some planes into the Twin Towers and shit like that. This was said right in front of somebody to me. I, I or this was said. This is the second party information. I wasn't there. I didn't see it. Okay, so don't clint me, anybody who watches this. But uh, you know, his partner said, "Oh, I'm definitely going to write, you know, a report on this." And my dude was like, "I'm not writing nothing on it." So um, you know, because th when you get up that high, they're they'll kill you in a heartbeat with certain things. They'll, I think they were trying to do that to me too. Um, that's a whole other story, but. When, and this is what I told my friend. Well, we're all going to die someday anyway. And look what they're doing into, in the world. So it really don't matter. You might as well come out and say it. No, at this point, no one's going to believe you. But still, when he told me that X amount of years later, I was like, wow, I lost contact with him for years. So then when, I, when he started telling me stuff, I was like, holy cow. And he used to be a chief. So one of the stories he told me when he was a chief is this gray man. You know, somebody who's dressed in like an overcoat, a hat, they call him gray man, came and delivered. Uh, and this was back in like the late 80s, early 90s, delivered a, a big envelope to him with a bunch of information they wanted him, wanted him to have now that he was a chief. And it was like Satanists bringing him shit is what it was. Mm -hmm. So like some of the stuff he described to me and that was. Uh, and he said that the ink, every time it gets out in the sun. It's, it's fading. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, dude, it's like disappearing ink. Are you kidding me? I was like, yeah, I make copies of it or something. I don't know. But there's just a lot of stuff that goes on that. Um, and there's people that were much higher up in law enforcement in many different you know ways than I was. And I could just imagine if at my small level, I seen what I seen, I can only imagine what the higher up levels, you know, I remember reading stories and I believe them just because what I've seen at my level, I believe the stories when, when you had some, uh, DEA officers arrest CEI, the CIA guys, 
down in South America. And then they're dealing with each other. CIA says, well, you can have this guy and that guy, but we, you can't have this one because he's national interest. All about drugs. And it was this dude who flew helicopters for him. And he was out in this location because if he, and he, this was on a video uh, that was on YouTube. And I actually went to the video because I read that book. Uh, it wasn't Behold the Pale Horse. It was um, Mass Engineering uh, Human Consciousness. And so they gave a link in that book. I think I, the link was on, or they gave a name. I was able to look the guy up that was still on YouTube. And he was out hiding in the jungle someplace because if they found him, they were going to kill him. Because mm -hmm. he was like, you know, blowing the whistle on this deep state war between high level agencies. Mm -hmm. So, so what you're describing is that um, satanic network, really, yeah, yeah. right? That, that, go, that infiltrates, I don't know, maybe the orders ultimately are from above coming down and then the officers on the ground are being used for yeah. their agendas, correct? Absolutely. And like one of the guys, this is so funny. One of the guys that was a, uh, he was a tech guy at the place I worked. Uh, I mean, and we're, I, we were kind of friends, you know, and hung out a few times and he he said well i used to be a satanist but now i'm an atheist now of course in my um you know in my ignorance at that time right this is like 15 20 years ago i was like oh you're just a bad christian then if you're a if you're a you know satanist i had no idea mm -hmm. uh and then later on i ran into a grotto and uh that was funny because uh they always had these like really nice like like little parties where they were like you had to be special to get invited to the party. And I had a friend that worked at the prison who was literally one of, he was one of their dogs that Mark described in his thing a couple years back. He was one of their dogs. Mm -hmm. So they had this thing that went on back in 2019. It was funny. So I was at this party and they had this thing where you got to go around this big mansion house and you got to, you could find these runes. And then you take the runes and you got to equate them to a number. Well, there's, you got to, you, as you, as this is a long thing that my wife was there to help me with it. Cause I wouldn't have probably met, but after we went, you know, through it so much, I'm like, wait a minute, let's just go do something. You go down to a safe, you have to get the number and use the number to open a safe, but you got to go through all these runes to do it. And then you go, you, you open it up and you well, guess what the number was. We're trying all this stuff. And I was like, let's just try six, six, six. And it was six, six, six. It was just fine. Um, yeah, uh, but they wanted to see who was going to figure that out. And they were either looking for their next member or their next dog. And once I realized what they were, you know, I left. So mm -hmm. when I heard, I knew I knew I was being tested. I knew there was some kind of test going on for several for people at that party is what it was. And uh, I'm, I don't want to I don't want to let them know I passed it. <laughs> And then I found out who they, you know, who they were. And I'm like, I ain't going back to around them at all. Mm -hmm. And then hearing Mark's stories that he had from, you know, when he was like deeply involved in it, even at the low level he was at, it all started clicking and making sense mm -hmm. then. You know, it just all starts coming together for you. And you take what you know and you bring that to the table and you see what other people know that they're bringing to the table. And next thing you know, you're able to put together this worldview that's actually pretty accurate and scary, which... Mm -hmm you know, brought me back to drinking too much last year. And I have admitted this on podcasts. I'm actually too honest sometimes, but I was consciously drinking, trying to put myself back to sleep. You know, I, I, I like turned into the fat Thor that was ashamed of himself and just wanted to drink himself to death. Like that's all. And then I was like, this ain't working. So I might as well stop. I'm waking up with a headache and the evil world is still here. So it's like, I'm not doing any, I'm not helping anything by this. So, I mean, again, it's another thing I got back under control. It's, it's not an issue, but still, um, and that's why I got this picture up behind me. Balance. It's all about balance. Balance is the key. And any advice, balance is key if you're not hurting anybody. So I, I kind of get into that in my book too. And that's one of the things I was thankful about when I found natural law is I realized I wasn't some moral piece of shit because I had vices. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's, yeah, I think it's really poignant, you know, your description of, of your observation of how many people on the force really didn't feel at peace with their jobs and oh. um, were dealing with this inner conflict yeah. every day. And so what for every one or two bad cops that are out there, right, for every one yeah. or two bad cops, I mean, like really, really bad. There's a whole bunch of other ones who are neutral or actually hate the system themselves. Right. Um, so then. Then it's hard for them to do their job, you know, to be living with this day in day out. And so yeah. you're saying a lot of them end up 
you know, trying to uh, maybe get some bad habits to sort of run away and uh, hide from that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, the sometimes with some of them, especially in some of the bigger cities, you're not going to see their marriages last. Um, you know, it, it's, 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 it's really pitiful what, what happens to, this, to a lot of these guys in, in this line of work, because it can be a very dangerous job in itself. And I remember I gave a description of it. When someone was asking me, and this is well over a decade ago, uh, what do you think about police work? And I was like, man, the low, the, 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 the low stress and high pay and general public adoration make it all worth it, dude. Go <laughs> for it. But uh, of course, that's all a joke, you know, but you, you really have no friends and you have no friends within a department that you're, you become a uh, you get isolated in, in, in a certain sense at times. You know, you might have a click. You might have two or three guys you trust and that'll be it. Mm -hmm. And right. if you even have one guy you can trust, one or two guys, you're kind of lucky because I've seen so much backstabbing. It's just, it's insane. So there's addiction um, often developing among folks working in the force and then oh, yeah. a lot of trauma. And what is the attitude around, um, you know, dealing with trauma and the effects of trauma on them? Um... Well, the effects of trauma, um, a lot of them don't want to admit it. And, and there's a reason why, because you're carrying a gun for a living. Mm -hmm. So when they've got their, um, what do they call them? EAP programs, employee assistant programs, where you can go and get counseling or mental health. Those are just uh, public relations fronts. Because as soon as you go to one of those things, you're going to probably end up losing your job. That's what they're afraid of. There's a stigma with the mental health thing that I had to go get help. And these guys are my, and I wrote about this in violence and ego. Also the first responders to the world trade center disaster, a lot of them in the debriefings, they had to go get counseling. So you have these really gritty street cops and EMTs that have seen some of the worst shit you can handle. And they were ashamed of themselves because they defecated on themselves because of the extreme adrenaline dump that they had. And I get all into that in Rise from Darkness, what an adrenaline dump actually physiologically is, what happens, you know, and I and I break it down between men and women because men and women have uh, different forms of adrenaline at different times. And, uh, you know, I can go into any of that too, but, I, you know, these, they were ashamed of themselves because they're like, I'm not, I can't do this job anymore because look what, I, look what happened to me. That shouldn't have happened. It's like, dude, you just, you just seen one of the most extreme things. You know, they had to say, no, you're normal. If that didn't happen, you're probably a sociopath, you know? So it's like, um, there's that, then no one wants to go get help. Nobody wants to go get help. Right. So it, the stuff that happens will eat you up inside. You know, I, I seen a, uh, I was on the scene of a double homicide. We're human. That bothers you. It's going to bug you. And I had to pull the video for it. And I didn't even know I had PTSD at first from it. Um, how I realized it was, is I'd be starting to fall asleep. And just as I'm getting that good, I'm about to fall asleep, that scene would pop into my head and wake me right up. And that was my first real experience with, wow, I got PTSD. Mm -hmm. I guess that's what that really is. Now I could talk about it now because I've gotten over it, right? But at the time, it gave me some issues. I wasn't going to go talk to nobody about that. So this eats these guys up. This eats these guys up. And then what they end up doing is, and they warn you about this in the police academy, don't ever let it turn into it's an us against them. We're, we're, we're serving at their, for them. So they teach you the right way in the police academy. A lot of times they'll tell you the right stuff. But then it ends up turning into an us against them. Who is the them? The them is all of you. And oh, me okay. and everyone else out there. And you'll see a lot of cops that have nothing but cop friends. All they'll do is talk shop uh, outside of usually with other department cops. They don't get along with the ones in their own departments. There'll be other departments. Um, I didn't hang out with cops when I was off duty. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm one of the rare people who didn't. All my friends were, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to hang out with cops off duty. I really hated the fucking job. Excuse my language. I wasn't a good order follower, man. I just wasn't. Um, mm -hmm. I never got in trouble, though. And that's something that I, I'd say, too. I wasn't. I didn't leave like I was in trouble. You know, I quit on my own. I just uh, September 12th, 2015. And my last evaluation is all OK. You know, I, I, it wasn't like I was in any trouble or anything. I just uh, I wasn't a good order follower. I was always getting in trouble for not doing what they would tell me to do. I just gaff them off. I wouldn't do it. 
So mm-hmm. it's like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing like, luckily I was never in a position that some of these people are going to find themselves in. Mm-hmm. Cause I was telling a friend of mine who works locally you, real soon, you police officers out there are going to find yourself operating in a spectrum of decision-making that you're going to have. And that spectrum is going to be bad to worse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's not going to be nothing good unless you're not in that system or you completely are over here and you totally refuse to, to do anything immoral. And that's why I think the outreach on what natural law is and on what actual objective morality is is so important. So they can understand what real morals are Mm -hmm. and won't follow any moral order. Mm-hmm. And right. I think I, I've said this in other podcasts too, and I can keep going. I'll let you guys ask me another question. I know I talk a lot. They, these, these politicians know how to obfuscate orders. These politicians obfuscate that gray area. They, they know how to obfuscate morals better than anybody. So that confuses the hell out of uh, police too. Oh, wait a minute. That was just legal. Now it's illegal. It's like, dude, think for yourself. Right. So what, what kind of response have you had from uh, people in the, police and military to your work now are you getting resistance you know crit- no, you getting- I, no um i had a lot of uh the people that i was like would give me any resistance that would you know you know are still in my life to do anything like that were my friends to begin with mm-hmm. and i always you know the one thing that i'll say and when i say it almost Every cop on that job is like, well, he's not lying about that. And that's when I say they're all waiting to fucking retire. They're counting the days to get the hell out of that job. Most of them. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's so there's anybody who would give me anything. They, you know, they, I'm not against them. I've told them in podcasts, I'm not against you. I just know you're going to be, you know, it's easy for some of the older guys on the department who are doing their victory lap to mm-hmm. say, I'm not going to do that. Mm-hmm. But I'm more worried about the 23 year olds, 24 year olds. Right. They got two years on the job. They just got married. They just bought a house. I'm worried about them and their testosterone levels and their intelligent levels are all where they're not supposed to be uh, for that job. So that's what I'm worried about. You know, what advice would you give those folks? Uh, I talked to uh, one of these young cops at the gym and I gave him that exact advice. I told him you probably just need to get off the job. They're going to give you more orders. And when they give you those immoral orders, you're going to have to say no. Right. You know, if they tell you to go to houses and take people's firearms, what are you going to do? That's immoral. You can't do it. You know, that's why I was very happy. I think it was Lock and Rose who talked about uh, the sheriff's department that might have been in Chicago who absolutely refused to enforce this gun confiscation law that they had passed. There's a lot of sheriffs that are going to do that. Yeah. But see, um, one of the things that happens every year around this time, it happens either in February. Or no, it's funny. I think it might happen in March. It, it, I think it happens in March. They have a national sheriff's conference in Washington, D.C. every year. So as far as I'm concerned, that's just to see who they can turn. I mean, period. That's just to see who they can turn. And I, I've got my uh, opinions about certain sheriffs. What's that? I said, beware of the Ides of March, eh? Well, game. yeah, yeah, exactly. Three, two, two. So it figures it happens around th- that time. And funny enough, uh, they would start ops on me after I retired because they can't keep people on you all year long. It's not cost effective. See, when they know when when they know that what you're when they know your stuff is legit, they go into what's called uh, cost containment. There's a whole industry on people who fake injuries and, and lie and stuff. There's a whole industry on it. There's a whole like job mm-hmm. thing on it. But when they know your stuff's legit, they automatically go into cost containment. So they, they can't stay on you all year long. But I, I started to notice a pattern over about two, three years. It didn't take me long. Hell, I got animals talking to me, right? I, I've talked about how I get, you know, animals, like, whatever. Not like Dr. Doolittle or anything. But um, it was not hard for me. To, yeah, it was not hard for me to notice a pattern that every March they would start an op and the op would get real heavy in in. Um, in April, and then it would go away. And then every September they would start one and would get real heavy in October. And when I say that, I just mean surveillance. Mm-hmm. So it was really hard for them to do surveillance on me. So at first what they would do is, is they try to sensitize you to their presence by having goofball people act peculiar in these gyms or anywhere they're going. So you're like, you notice them. And then later on, they, they put people there that would belong there, but I'm still making them. So you know how many people have headphones? 
mm -hmm. with cameras in them. Wow. And I have little bottles that they'll have with, can you know, you know how many video they, they probably have of me doing this? <laughs> I mean, they probably got more, more video of me doing that than anything else. Cause I didn't never lie about anything. So I haven't stopped what I'm doing as far as, you know, going to the gym. I'm only 40% bad. That's not half bad, you know, as far as being 40%, you know, hurt or whatever. Um, and, and again, my injury almost killed me in 2017. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a I had a real come to Jesus moment after that, so to speak. Uh, the, the spiritual awakening, the, you know, the second really tough night of the soul happened in 2017 when I nearly died because what they were giving me to take away the back pain, which was intractable. I couldn't walk. I was paralyzed. Yeah. Um, and I talked about that in the last podcast I just did. I was in there for seven, um, eight days and seven nights. Mm -hmm. And uh yeah, I couldn't walk. It was bad. So they're giving me Dilata every three to four hours. They're giving me all, they're shooting me up with all this stuff and my breath was giving out. My lungs were collapsing. And uh, I remember all I kept thinking during this time frame was, I remember feeling this over sense of love. There was a sense of love that I just, it was like, wow. And my eyes were closed and I, I can see like my aura right beneath my skin. And it was like a real thin silver aura, but my eyes were closed. But I was so weak. It was so small. I just felt so weak. And I remember thinking to myself, like, um, I I never regretted anything I did. I was thinking of how much I regretted having such a petty ego or how much I regretted like, I didn't do this. I didn't do that. And, and I was telling this guy, young man this. Um, and he asked, did you ever regret love? And I, I answered him without, you know, hesitation. No, I regretted not loving more. But I'm also an asshole. So I, I kind of run the gambit. You know, I'm a firearm instructor. I'm a yoga instructor. I remember telling Locker and Rose that. And he was like, how about that? Because you're a regular <laughs> person who does whatever you want to do. I was like, yeah. Because normally, you know, yoga instructors that I know are woo-woo left wing. And NRA firearms instructors are tea party right wing. And it's like, man, get over this party stuff, man. It's just more dialectic separation to separate everybody. Yeah. So. I mean, if anything, talking to you guys has been kind of um, therapeutic for me, but it, it, it just goes to show the conflict right inside. Right. You know, yeah. so it's like, you know, we, we want to like close that divide. And that's what this shows that you guys are doing is how do we close that divide? Well, the, the divide first has to get closed within yourself. Once you can say, hey, I'm not going to accept these contradictions. Right. And it's been hard, right, for police officers over the last few years because there's been this intense um, criticism and attack mm -hmm. on the police force and then this other polarity of defense of the police force and compassion. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, how how do you bridge those extremes? So that's that would be the toughest thing for me, because when I was looking at uh, in 2020, what I was seeing was the very worst of of the police. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean that from, uh, you know, what, what are they called? Uh, you know, what was the guy wearing a purple mask with the hammer, you know, agent provocateurs, right? From, from agent provocateurs that are definitely involved in law enforcement in some capacity or another, right? To, hey, don't do anything while this property is being destroyed. Okay when they should have been protecting people on property. And then when they're given the go ahead, stop this, they're using excessive force. Right. Now I know some of that was fake. Some of that was WWE. Some of that was street theater. I, I know one particular one, I'm not gonna even say it, but it was street theater. But there was a lot of excessive force that was in street theater, let's face it, like a whole shitload of it, right? Mm -hmm. So the bridge that gap, and again, the only way to do it is the way that we're trying to do it now and is to get them to think for themselves and understand that, you know, what is really moral and what isn't smoking marijuana is okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Keep arresting rapists, keep arresting murderers, keep doing that stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's the, I don't, I don't see it getting any better as, as far as, as, as long as they're keeping us at war with ourselves and war with each other and war with all these different um, you know, separating dialectics to keep us fighting one another. I don't see it getting better. And here's what I think. If, if we were to be allowed to organically evolve, mm -hmm. I think within three, four generations, we would be on a much higher level of consciousness. I'm talking almost telepathic between mm -hmm. each other. 
And it's just this is just a theory, but you know, uh, you know, I'm called a conspiracy theorist all the time. So okay, this is just one of my theories. It's not an actual conspiracy, but I think the reason why they want to chip our brains is because if we were allowed to, you know, this is just stuff I think about. If we were allowed to actually organically raise our consciousness level to the point where we could telepathically talk with each other, even if it's just imparting an emotion on somebody, not in a whole conversation. I'm just talking an emotion. Empathy, yeah. Any, any type of emotion, if we could start to tie that telepathic ability in, say, three, four generations organically as we evolve, which I think is where humanity would go, because nowadays more and more shamans are being born, more and more people with psychic, natural psychic abilities are being born, although you can develop them, more people, so there's more people being born with a natural aptitude to them. And my next book is going to be about psychic phenomena. That's cool. Um, Maybe it's nature's response, you know? Yeah, I, I think this is, they, they know this, and I think this is why they want to put chips in people's brains. And hence mm -hmm. all the extra needle craft with the scheduling, you know. You know. No, I don't, I, I've got so many theories. I got so sick of being called. But hey, why man, I got a theory because the universe is conspiring with us to do some good in the world, you know. I think so, too. All that, I mean, you know, conspiratorial crap and, and all that. Yeah. Too, you know, to conspire, oh. to breathe. You know, together on a subject such as you know what we're talking about, dissolving the divide in so many ways. Yeah, man. I'm seeing. So what I'm seeing, and I think it's really cool, is um, it's unfortunate it needs to happen, but I still think it's really cool. Is this this venue, this 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 medium, is bringing everybody together that I normally wouldn't have brought together. So I know it's being used. It's betrayed us in a certain sense. Technology's betrayed us in a certain sense because it's in the wrong people's hands. But it's also being used to help. Like, I would have never thought, I mean, I got to interview David Icke. Wow. Who, who, who the hell am I to interview David Icke? I just, on a whim, said, I'm, get, I'm getting sick of being called a conspiracy theorist. Hell with it. I'm going to message our king and see if he'll talk to me. And he said, yeah, how about on 411 information? I thought that was kind of a cool thing. So I got to interview and talk to David Icke for a couple hours. Who, who would ever thought that you're going to get together with people and we're getting together for one human cause. We're yeah. getting together for, for, for good of all different backgrounds, yeah. colors, races. I mean, I've got, I've, I've gotten friends now on Facebook from all over the world now. And then there was the, the PSYOP fake accounts that I had to get rid of. They're, that's going to hit us all. But um, yeah, there's hope. There's definitely hope. I, I, don't, I don't like to get on there and sound like, oh, there's this is this, this is that. I can tell you right now, we got to keep doing this because as soon as we quit talking, the bad stuff that's going to happen is going to be really bad. And um, like, I thought you were in France, Derek, for some reason. I didn't know you're on the West Coast. Um, hey, we, you want to mean? Uh, I spent 13 years over there, but uh, I'm over, yeah, in in America. Well, then you're in America. You're okay. But America's the last country that's okay because we're well armed. Um, yeah. Uh, real quick, man. Like the. What I've noticed with the difference between the police over there in France and, and over here is that, you know, over there, they, first of all, over here, like growing up, I always felt like, you know, the police force is like, has this like intimidating, you know, uh, just, you know, aura about it, you know, and, uh, right. and it's almost like it strikes fear. And, and it is like, it, you know, based off of this, you know, fear based mind control and, and what they've been through, it's, you know, flipping the negative cycle onto the people because, you know, police uh, force and all that, they're pressured and, you know, have this fear of, you know, possibly losing their jobs or, you know, yeah. you know, losing their life even or whatever. It's a dangerous job, as you said. But, uh, yeah, the the police force was not all that militarized in France for, for the longest time. It was really until those, you know, false flags and stuff and whatever actual events that happened in regards right. to like Bocaton and other, you know, sh uh, shootings and, and what have you. But, uh, yeah, I noticed, right. you know, a uh, huge, uh, militarization of the police force. Cause they were kind of, they were almost like a joke compared to I, like I, especially, uh, p police in, a, in America, just really, uh, with their kind of right. like, funny little cars sometimes or whatever. And, you know, but, even you know, when I was a full-time cop as a training officer, I wrote a whole article against the militarization of the police. I was I, I wrote a whole article against it because if you give new tools to tools, they're going to find an excuse to use them. And I didn't like I'm not saying don't have some stuff. I was on the SWAT team. I get it. Don't have some stuff in case of bad situations, but you don't need tanks. You don't need like all this mil military surplus that they're handing over to to to. I, I didn't agree with that myself. It was too much. Um, so that was one thing. 
The other thing that I think with police here in this country, and this is from my own childhood, is it is generational. Mm. So imagine you are five or six years old and you're with your dad. And this was when I was with my real father. And you look at your dad as the strongest, mightiest superhero in the world. Then all of a sudden you're driving in the van with him or whatever, the car. And he's like, sit down, don't act up. There's the police. Wait a minute. Why is, why is Superman here afraid of them? So mm-hmm. next thing you know, as you grow, I mean, there was a time when I was a teenager and I got my, you know, I got a pretty good ass whooping by him. That's a whole other story too. And I put that story in rise from our, uh, in violence and ego. And at the time I was like, well, if I can't beat him, I might as well join him. So generationally, You've got your parents, people that you look up to. Don't be afraid of the police, the police, the police. Yeah. So it automatically makes you think, well, I guess I got to be them then. Right. Uh, and then you, you go you go through school and you get all this other stuff. So there's 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 a contradiction right there and why someone wants to become a cop. I wanted to protect and serve, but I also, hey, look at me. My superheroes were afraid of cops, right? So I'm not saying cops don't do good things. There was a lot of cops running into the World Trade Center. had no clue that there was their own country allowing the shit to happen. Who knew they probably weren't going to come out along with firemen and EMTs. There are cops that will do heroic things. But then when they're told to stand down, like in the PSYOP in Texas, they sit, they stand down. Like I couldn't stand down if kids are being shot. Right. Right. I, I, I actually did a whole podcast on it. I'm so pissed about it. Yeah. I, my podcast doesn't get a whole lot. Who knows how many people will see it, but I, I know what I'm seeing, you know, and I went into a theory on why I think that was just a, a mm-hmm. false flag. But, um, so have you seen trends, you know, that you can identify since when you first entered the force to what you're seeing now in, in like the gradual changes um, to become a certain way, you know? I would say that the, uh, I think the trend of everybody having cameras is actually a plus. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because you act a lot better when you're on camera the whole time. Right. So that's 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 a a, a good trend that I see. Mm-hmm. Um, but the bad trend that will come out of that is cops end up being a lot more sneakier. So, for mm-hmm. instance, uh, I forgot her name in California. She's given those cops hell. She's one of my friends on Facebook. Uh, Patty or um, for the, cl- closing the beach. Oh yeah, I forget her name. Oh my god, I can't believe it. I feel so bad if she watches this. Oh my god, I can't. Um. <laughs> But uh, I commented on one of her things because uh, she was talking to the canine unit. Okay. And I, I pointed right out to her where the canine officer gave the message to his dog to start barking so he can get out of that conversation. So, oh. they, so they get sneakier. So that dog has got his eyes on that situation the whole time. So like if she would have started beating that cop up, that dog would have immediately responded. That's how he's trained to do. But until then, he's just going to sit there. So the guy pressed the button. I watched him press it. He pressed that button. It sends a signal into the dog. It's a, it serves as a preparatory command, like in the Marine Corps doing marching drill. Marching drills and the things they have you do in the military, that's just to develop instant obedience to orders. That's all that is. So that dog heard that preparatory command. Now he's on him. The next nonverbal thing that officer does is going to dictate what the dog does. And the officer, watch the video, the officer, and she'll know which one I'm talking about. Um, the officer then looked at his watch and the dog starts barking. That means I've been here long enough. Can you bark? So I have, can I, oh, I got to go take care of my dog. So I think there's a trend where cops get a little, you know, sneakier in that sense, maybe. Um, if there's anything more trendier or more more darker than that i'm not with the departments that i've been gone for so long i don't know i'm, I'm out of it i look at it uh with the same type of contradictions everyone else looks at it like oh god why are you doing that uh no you know um here's what i can tell people cops are afraid of cops too so like when i was a uh, an active cop and i was off duty and i'm driving and a cop all of a sudden pulls out behind me because i'm speeding my first thing i say to myself is fuck shit like, we don't want to get stopped either mm-hmm. so cops are afraid of cops i've watched cops on the side of the roads getting into fights i mean uh i don't know wow i had no idea man <laughs> oh yeah there's videos you could pull up uh, on youtube of like there was this county sheriff and the city cop getting into a fight they're on duty and got right into a fight it was it was like wow that's all right i'm glad y'all didn't shoot each other or anything but 
Um, Damn. Can I ask you a question real quick? Because, sure. uh, you know, the Telly Vision programming uh, has so many flavors. And in, in Tell Live Your Vision. Yeah. Um, and there's there's one, you know, programming in regards to, you know, like praising uh, certain types of order followers, you know, whether it be, you know, there's so many uh, cop uh TV shows and series and all that stuff. And like, same with like the medical hospital yeah. folks. And now there's like, you know, fire department and all that stuff. Um, I'm not saying there's something super f wrong with all that, but uh, I've noticed there's, you know, it's almost this like programming to glorify, you know, like we're, for the police uh, series, for example. And, and yeah, there's like, you know, the show like cops or whatever, or Reno right. Night, that kind of makes the uh, silliness uh, of these things same right. scripts for the medical stuff. But you know what I mean? Like, it just seems like, you know, people that watch this stuff, they're thinking like, oh, these cops are like superheroes sometimes or this and that or like the what NCIS. Yeah. Yeah. yeah NCIS. Like, yeah. And all this stuff. And like they get it like and they make it seem like, OK, there's going to be like a, a dozen a packs of people looking, you know, always day in, day out searching for like a one missing person, that kind of stuff. And yeah, it, people have such an obscure idea of what it actually is on a day to day basis, you know, in the law force, in a sense. You know what I mean? Right. I, I couldn't watch cop shows. They would disgust me. <laughs> and um, I also I, and I used to get on my wife. I used to get on my wife about this because she's in the medical profession and um I couldn't understand how she would watch ER because I had worked, you know, security police at different hospitals and stuff. So I'd worked at hospitals too. And I'm like, I couldn't watch ER. That disgusted me also. I was like, none of this shit is, well, how do you even watch this? Like I would ask, I was like, is this your fantasy on how you wish it was? So, uh, cause there's some pretty, yeah, I couldn't watch it. It's, it's <laughs> complete BS, but I think it's mind controlling to make everyone think like, again, I grew up and I, and I joke about it, but I grew up to watching GI Joe. Mm-hmm. You know, little did I know we really would be fighting Cobra, Reptilian, yeah. the faceless reptilian someplace. Like, I like what did Hasbro no know? Draconian, man. Shit. Yeah. yeah. So, like, you grow up watching all this stuff and, you, and you're like, OK, this is what I'm going to go do. Especially little boys are trained to, you know, be heroes and action and all this and all that. And I talk about that, too, about how our adrenaline works between men and women. There, when Women's adrenaline kicks in, but theirs usually kicks in a little later. Go ahead and share more about that, would you? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, like the, the adrenal gland, of course, sits above the kidneys, and whenever you're, by, whenever you uh, are faced with extreme stress, a fight or flight, right, um, it immediately dumps uh, a cocktail of chemicals into your blood, uh, adrenaline being among them, which will cause your heart to probably triple within seconds. And what it does is, it, it pulls your um, it pulls the blood from all the major organs into all the major muscles to get ready for fight or flight. And that's why sometimes back in the you know medieval days, somebody would take a, an injury that is obviously going to, they're going to die from, but they didn't die right away because they weren't bleeding out. The, 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 the organs aren't full of blood at that point in time. And the brain is a, an organ. So this is why when we uh, have an adrenaline dump, we're going to, we're going to have time dilation. We're going to have extreme uh, audio and visual exclusion. Our, our near our vision our vision is going to narrow to about 30 percent we're going to intensely focus on that threat things are going to slow down and you're not going to have no fine motor skills all you're going to be left with is gross motor skills which is why repetition and training is so important um but uh, the reason why women's is a little bit different is the men's are a little more uh quick right that saber-toothed tiger comes into the village the men boom right now we got to fight it well the women got to keep their wits about them a little bit longer to get the kids and you know go get the kids out of there exactly. and then by the time the men get eaten by the tiger and are approaching the women now their adrenaline is kicked up to fight and i would just say have you ever been in an argument with your girlfriend or your wife and a half hour later after you you know went and calmed down and came home and you're like hey, everything's fine she's just getting going mm -hmm. so that's part of how the adrenaline works between uh you know men and women and i think it's something that should be celebrated not obfuscated you know as far yeah. as gender is concerned so, um, yeah, that's, I put all that in the book and I give some, you know, uh, in my first book, Violence and Ego, some uh, examples of times I was really adrenalized and got lucky. Like, you want to talk about adrenaline, take a key and try putting it into a lock to unlock a door 
when someone's getting beat up really bad on the inside and screaming for help and blood's everywhere and you know you're about to get into a fight besides having to help somebody, yeah. it, you, you turn into, it's crazy. Even when you're trained, uh, I can talk about all that too. Like uh, the, our complex of the brain deals with the, you know, fight, flight, fornicate, food, right? There's a fifth F that's freeze. When it comes to self-defense, you'll freeze. And the quicker you could break the freeze, the better chances you are will have of surviving that encounter. And it doesn't matter how, like the how, like the highest trained Navy SEAL will freeze. Everyone freezes. It's just the more trained you are, the quicker you break the freeze. How do they train people to do that? Well, um, I forgot what the call, what the training's called, but you would know it if I said it. Um, you'll have a word, or you'll have like two words that you'll say to yourself when you freeze and those two words will help you. You know, like when you, you tap your finger, what's mm -hmm. that called? You know what kind of th uh, therapy I'm talking about? Um, God, I gotta look this up. Like cognitive well, recall or something? Fuck. I don't... Yeah, because you, you, you think this thought, you tap your fingers and it reminds you of that. I, I right. forgot what like, you... like a classical conditioning, you know, association. association. Yes, it, it's that type of association. Right. So like there's a mental, like I would say move now. It wouldn't matter what I did, but my mind would say, move now. Right. And I was real used to that. And I'm telling you, I probably would still be okay. I probably would still break my freeze quicker than most people, although I'm not in that line of work anymore. Um, you'd be surprised at people who are trained and in that line of work who do freeze up and are complete cowards. I mean, so I, I, I couldn't tell you, like when I worked in the prison, for instance, I, I could just... There was this guy who was watching his, uh, uh, his officer get thrown over the second tier, and he froze. He wouldn't help the officer who was about to be murdered. And it was a female officer, brand new, brand new, jumped on the inmate's back. So, like, I, uh, I got a lot of respect for women. You know, she obviously had that right balance and knew when to take action where the guy froze up. So, there was no absolutes. I hate to make blanket statements on anything, but... Um, so to, to um, kind of program that uh, response to deprogram, you know, your freeze, your natural freeze response, is that from in the training that you you did? Is that like just repeatedly practicing? Like how did well, how did that over and over and over again? And then what really brings it about is real life experience because there's no amount of training that's ever going to actually do that for you. You have to have the real life experience and that comes with time. Mm -hmm. um, there's no, yeah, there's, there's no uh, way of getting around real life experience. Uh, you get the training, but then you have to actually have the experience right. and you get easier and it gets easier and easier for you to immediately break your freeze and go the more experience you have. So do you see, like for the folks that are in there for years and years and years, do, do you see that officers get more detached? I know what you're going to say. Yeah. Empathy and emotion. Yeah. They get, they get uh, apathetic, mm -hmm. apathetic to violence. Mm -hmm. um, like I seen this guy, he was a old out of shape looking chief, but he had been a cop for many years very kindly walk up to somebody that was fighting and they were wrestling with this guy. And I don't know what the whole situation was about. Um, he just stepped on the dude's hand while he's drinking coffee. Okay. Like this, this is normal shit that goes on here. Right? No, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's not. Uh, so the, they, you, what happens, they become very apathetic to violence and it's the same thing with combat, you know, soldiers, combat veterans. Um, you know, they get very apathetic to it. And you know, something that I would warn anybody in the mental health profession, because I had to deal with it myself, is secondary PTSD from hearing these horrific stories. Yeah. I had to deal with a lot of combat vets and I would hear horrific stories, including people I worked with yeah. who had problems because they were involved in, in, in serious combat in Fallujah. And then all of a sudden there's a bang or a noise over here and he had swung around and he shot and killed the mother and her daughter mm. he couldn't get over that for that yeah. was that did him yeah but you're in the middle of combat you don't wait you shoot and ask questions later and you know how many women and children how many innocent people were murdered for that psyop fucking war 
Um, yeah, I, I, I got my adopted son out of the Marine Corps. I didn't want him to be the first kid on his block to get a confirmed kill. So after those many years in the Marines, he got out as a sergeant and never had to do anything, thank God. But um, is, there compassion? Yeah. is there compassion for these folks who, who witness these horrific things, you know, and then, you know, you go back? Is there, uh, what's the the process for helping I, well you know there is there there are gems okay i know you're involved as a counselor like in the, you know the mental health profession there's people out there that i would say that are like you they're they're gems they really try to help but there's a lot of callous people out there also so like one of the main problems that i see and i just talked about this on tech chat 48 is uh people that would go into the psyche ER that are having these issues mm -hmm. so they go into the psyche ER, well, the first thing that's happening to them is they're getting strip searched for staff safety. That's kind of dehumanizing. So that's, they're not really in a good mood after that. <laughs> then they're asked this battery of questions and then they have to go sit down and they've got like questions they might want to call somebody or whatever. And then the nurses that they'll deal with in there, a lot of times those nurses will be mean to them on purpose just to trigger them so they can page a doctor and we need to get this guy to cocktail. He's acting out. Yeah. yeah. So, there was a lot of times, and that's one of the investigations I was doing that wasn't liked mm -hmm. because I was going to be the one to have to talk the guy down or, you know, maybe have to wrestle with the dude. I didn't want to do that. And I know that we're doing that on purpose. I know that because when I was in a psyche, ER, one of them tried to do it to me and she could. And um, it was just funny. I was able to uh, I had her laughing at herself at the absurdity of what she was trying to tell me. Uh, of what I was complaining about. And uh, I, I don't even know if I put that in my book. I might keep that one to myself. But either way, I already knew the joke. I already knew what it was all about. I've, I've watched them try to trigger people and trigger people on purpose just to give them the cocktail. Then they're going to be asleep for most of that person's shift. That's not giving care. Right. No. And after they've dealt with that treatment and they get with a clinician, well, how do you think they're going to act with this doctor? You know, I, 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 so there's a lot of bad, there's good though. There's gems. I'm not saying there isn't, there are real good caring gems out there, but there's a lot of bad in between. It's the whole gamut of humanity, man. It's a, it's a melting pot of humanity. Jeez. And you go back to the station and I bet they act like nothing happened, right? It's not like people talk about those things much, is it? Well, when they start talking about them, they talk about them in a way where, um, again, that, that, that apathy is just there. Mm -hmm. The desensitization. Uh, the, the, the de desensitization. You get desensitized. Yeah, they, you get desensitized to the violence. You get desensitized to all of it. So then what ends up happening is, is you become desensitized yourself to committing violence. Right. But this is all human behaviors that we can turn around within ourselves if we can actually take a deep look inside ourselves and say, hey, I was wrong. I was fucked up. Yeah. And that's if you're involved in that, that's what you need to do when you got those contradictions going on. If you if you have them and you can identify them, and I think a lot of cops out there can. There's a lot of good cops out there. These are people and military. I want them on our side in the upcoming apocalypse. Right. You know, we need their help, uh, and hopefully we get it because they're doing the best they can to divide the entire world up. And what I would tell people is, is this: I had to tell a friend this, who was like a he was a trumper, and he was a trumper, and he was a. Uh, but he also was saying, you know, like this, he could tell that this is definitely a psyop of a, of a, of a pandemic or whatever, you know, and uh, he knows that the, the stuff going on with the, with the vaccines isn't just pharmaceutical companies. There's something else to it. It's not just about money. There's something else going on. And I had to just say to him after he told me his Trumper stuff, um, I was like, dude, you're completely wrong about Trump. It's either all a conspiracy or none of it is take a look at how they all the governments of the world work together to lock the entire world down it's either all conspiracy or none of it is now he's no longer so now he's an anarchist so like now I've, I've i'm converting people to anarchism and it's funny because on my website i had to take my anarchy symbol down the same symbol you got up on here i used to have it on the website and i still have it on podcast things but it was on my main page i was getting a 50 percent bounce rate you know how you can check your stats and if, I mean, 50% bounce rate, they'd see that A and they'd leave. Mm. And it's like, oh, yeah, maybe I should put this like, it stands for Avengers. Stay on the site. <laughs> you know, kind of, um, but yeah, yeah, so I took. Should we just, you know, folks listening, sometimes they don't have a true sense of the, the true definition of anarchy, just means no. like no rulers. 
no masters right. under the laws of natural law and cosmic law, you know, right. That kind of stuff. Under the, under the creator's law, like God with a capital G, however you want to put it. Um, those laws were already put into effect. And I like how I, you know, I like how it gets broken down. It's just like, you know, magnetism or gravity, you can't see it, but it's there. And, I've seen it at work in my life and people around me's life with the karma that they face and the karma that I faced. Mm -hmm. Like when I was in the psyche yard, you guys are probably of the, of the, of the age group. I'm guessing that you probably remember this TV show called um, tales from the crypt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The whole concept of the show is, you know, you, what Angela, yeah, you end up, it's whatever you were doing ends up happening to you. That was me in this, in the psyche are like, I literally, I'm like, Oh my God. So it's, that was, if that's not cosmic law, uh, saying, Dan, get out of this shit. I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. And I started experiencing a lot of supernatural phenomenon that I now call simply natural, um, that some people won't believe, but it was these things that I started to experience that set me into researching. And it was research that brought me, uh, you know, across hermetic principles and some other people and then brought me to Mark's work. And, you know, you need a wide eclectic, you know, variety of research. I get that. But Mark gives a wide eclectic variety of research because he Mark gives you every <laughs> rabbit hole that he's ever been in. And he gives you all these books to read and all these other researches you can go check out. There's, you can cross reference stuff just based on his stuff. Yeah. So, Mark Fascio, what on earth is happening? Yeah, yeah he, I, I, I've quick, turned a lot of people on his website, so it's... You saw his presentation, you know, on the subject of, you know, order followers, police force, and all that, you know, his presentation of, you know, the unsacred masculine and the order following and how that's just, you know, it's uh, inverted, you know, the yeah. sacred masculine pr uh, protects, you know, that kind of principle and all that stuff, and how... There's so much occult mockery, you know, going back oh, to there is. the police hats they have or the checkered stuff or the in inverted uh, pentagrams and all that stuff. And also, I wanted to ask you also, because, you know, there's a lot of Freemason symbols on a lot of police badges. And I thought, you know, it was interesting hearing you say that some police officers are kind of afraid of other police officers. I thought like, you know, they were like, a lot of them were in the same gang in a sense. And so I had dark Masons that were gang stalking me at the orders of their masters and fuck them. Um, I'll just leave it at that. I, I actually talked into my phone because I know I was being listened to and they stopped. It was, it was kind of funny anyway. Yeah. I was at a, outside of a Mason lodge uh, up in Georgia, in Georgia, and they had their symbol was an inverted pentagram and it usually isn't. So I know that was definitely a dark lodge. And then something that I put on one of my uh, podcasts is I, had never noticed it before, but I looked at the Congressional Medal of Honor, the highest military award you can get, and the, the uh, uh, Medal of Valor uh, in police work. Both of those are invented or inverted pentagrams. Mm -hmm. So I, I can tell you, like, I ran into Mark's work in, like, February or March of 2019. Absolutely in love with his work until about July when I came across Cosmic Abandonment, and then I hated the dude for about a day. <laughs> no, I mean, I was in complete because I had never heard him talk up to that point. I only had like a half a year of listening to him, listening to his going through his podcast. What I'm happy about is when I when I started picking him up at episode 200, I was like, well, let me go back to 190 at least. And then around 205, 206, I'm like, let me go back to number one. So I started I was keeping up while I was also doing the beginning episodes before I ever heard him even say, go back to the beginning. I had never heard him say that. Um, so I was glad that I was already like in route to do, I was already doing that, but cosmic abandonment was like a real punch in the mouth. And then I had to sit there with myself for a little bit and, uh, you know, and it was funny because I was actually still a commissioned officer at that time. I just wasn't working. I was given a choice to come back and I didn't, and I was still given that choice in 2020 and I didn't. Okay. Um, as of 2020, I still had a badge in my wallet. So here's a funny story I'll tell. I get to Florida and just when you get inside Florida, about like three miles inside Florida, they have a, uh, a checkpoint all of a sudden. You're being filtered into this checkpoints with me and my daughter. I'm very upset I lost the audio. I had audio of it. I'm like, I'm going to audio this. I've, audio has saved my behind in my life. So I've already recorded a lot of things and I'm, I'm audioing this. So as I pull up to this checkpoint, already knowing that, you know, there was a COVID-19 checkpoint. And if you had a temperature, they were sending you over here. And then, so I pull up 
and I look at this dude, I'm like, what's this about? And he's like, yeah, we got to uh, check for, you know, what state you're from and check temperature or whatever and see, you know, driver's license. So I, I showed him my driver's license. He seen my badge. He's like, oh, okay, you can go. You're, you're, you're good. And then I get up to the second, you know, guy and he starts to stop me. And the guy back there yells, no, 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 he's good. Let him go. He's good. So I'm sitting there and after all this, you can hear this on the audio. Uh, unfortunately, the phone got messed up. I lost the audio, but I'm sitting there saying into this, oh, we know this is definitely about a virus. My badge magically saved me from this virus. They just let me go through. I guess I'm immune to it. So literally get the F out of here about the science. Like that's why I get so I get oh, angry about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like it's just I, I don't I forgot what the initial the original question was, but that's a story that just came to my mind that just happened. Well, I was talking about you know um cosmic culpability. So everything he said about you want someone to be proud of you, you were an abused kid, or this or that, and then you you know you 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 get into this line of work, everything he said about us is true. Every single thing. And I was just like, that was like, I happened to admit that to myself. Like, holy shit, he's the abandonment issues. Yeah, no shit. That's it. So you're looking for the surrogate parent to be proud of you doing some kind of job. And so that was a hard pill for me to swallow that I was actually involved in wrong employment, no matter how good of a job I tried to do. And that's why I'm doing this now. I'm still trying to follow that part of the oath that just says protect and serve. Um, and that's it. So I don't, um, I don't know that we've been on here a while. Right, wow. This is cool. Hour 20 minutes. Is there any, any other questions you guys yes. want to ask me? Cause I can yes, keep going. Yes. yes. I want to yeah, go back to, to uh, um, so the, yeah, the whole system is, you know, messed up, you know, the, you know, it's like, it's like a, we're living in a debt based society with this monetization on everything, including, you know, the prisons and the police and all that stuff. Right. Uh, what we're looking to do with, you know, anarchy or voluntarianism or abolitionism right. yes it's, you know like rebuilding a hermetically sealed society in a sense and uh how to heal all, all the collective trauma and all these things and uh you know visualizing alternatives to prisons like you said in some of these villages and i've heard you know stories and just ideas of that nature as well and like it can be something that's completely different than what we have and uh make a transition although it just seems really tough because it, it is kind of like this gordian knot where there's so much intertwined uh, entanglement of so many things so many factors i mean like the the cartels and whatever else in cahoots with what police force and all this stuff and the chain of commands and, and all these things but uh i like the idea of yeah just like the good old-fashioned militia it, you know, the, the intentions are pure, you know, it's on a voluntary basis, pretty much. Right. And it's for all the right reasons. And yeah, there's no meeting any kind of fucking quota or, or any kind of stuff. Right. It's just, you know, holding down the fort, you know, ain't looking for trouble, you know, just making but sure you're there, you're there to actually protect if you have to. Right. And, um, you know, I like a lot of Larkin Rose's, you know, analogies on, on all that. You, you, you figure a lot of the drug cartels wouldn't even exist if drugs were just legal. Do whatever the hell you want. Um, so there's a, like a lot of violent crimes that exist because of man-made authority that wouldn't be there if there wasn't some law on it, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think anybody with any kind of common sense can come to that conclusion. I mean, a lot of cops can even probably come to that conclusion. Uh, yeah, I, guess, I want to be in the direction of alternatives. Um, and there was a um, a guy I heard of, I think he's out of Chicago, I think his name is Brown, where he created like an alternative uh, force that's not government sanctioned. <laughs> I, heard, I heard of it. Where people, instead of calling the police, can call this, his company and he'll send out folks to deal with a situation, whether like domestic violence or um, right. whatever. And, and it's, you know, like, it's like, like a private police force that's not public. Yeah. And, um, yeah, only thing that, I, that I'm leery of is, is I see this repeated pattern throughout all of like, human history that just keeps happening is if we try to fix a problem from the same level of consciousness that created it, we end up full circle again. So I can see that private police force turning into a bunch of thugs, too, if they're not, you know, so I, it might be a, a temporary temporarily better. 
I think it would be better if something was happening and all the neighbors got together and said, Hey, what the F's going on here? Mm-hmm. You know, if, if people, you know, were, were committed to, um, cause I know we all want our own autonomy, right. But we also need community. And if you live in tight communities, your community can take care of stuff like that. I would think eventually, especially if we all get to that higher consciousness level, which they don't seem to want us to do, mm-hmm. you know, um, but I think I think we could do it. We're heading in that direction. There's a, there's a lot of people waking up today. There's a lot of people being born today that have special abilities. There's a lot of um, I like to see a little more connectedness within the community and more in person meetings and stuff like that and more get togethers. Like uh, I've got a you know a team around here of people. Mm-hmm. Okay, but maybe there can be a team here, a team here, a team here, and then you have a regional team. Yes. Okay, and then a region, a region, a region, a region. So it becomes an oligarchical um system of anarchy where we can get together when we need to and we would have more people that were statists on our side than you'll think when when it comes right down to authoritarians stepping in and trying to you know do what they're going to do or try to do what they're going to do i think i i don't think they're going to win i've heard other people say this they're not going to win but if it gets to that point if we can't convince people through through peaceful conversations and just um you know, I like Larkin Rose's, uh, what he has with the questions he'll ask statists and how he does it. He gets them laughing at themselves. If you can do it that way, man, that's the best way you can possibly do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, I'll give you, for instance, one of my yoga teacher teachers, uh, I'm not going to say no names, but didn't like I was what I was posting. And I, I basically was triggering, triggering this person. And they're, cause they're very far left wing. So everything I was posting was triggering to them. And, uh, I finally made a heartfelt post that I knew would get to, it was like a heart share post about the whole thing and how it breaks my heart that people don't understand what true freedom is. Mm-hmm. And, and I would have to go back and look up the post I write better than I talk sometimes, actually all the time. But, um, she sent me an inbox and was like, okay, that's good. Now just let it sit and let people have, let people make a decision. And I was able to let it sit for like until the next day. And I'm back at it because we are getting bombarded 24 seven by the thing that tells lies to our vision on the television it is a billion dollar, you know, propaganda machine. You want me just to state my opinion and how this is all BS once? And let people make up their mind. So I, um, I, I was after a couple more days of posting what I consider to be truth, or hey, th- think about this. And they're taking it as I'm against their, you know, religious god, their political religious, you know, whatever. And then they unfriended me. Well, that's cool. You know, um, I believe in free association, so you unfriended me. But like in my mind, people like that are not. Um, she's she's a good person. And I think a lot of people on the left mean well, but you can't give stuff to people by stealing it from other people. It's that it's 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 flawed. Yeah. It's against natural law. You're stealing to it's flawed. Okay. Mm-hmm. Robin Hood is cool, but it didn't really happen the way you think it happened. You can't steal from the poor to give to the poor. That's basically what they're doing. Um, but I think some of them got good intentions. They're just not. I don't think it was thinking correctly. I think the, the social engineering that, that we're hit with, they make everyone think in terms of blue and red, de, you know, Republican, de, de, you know, I, Demopublican, Republican, they're all the same to me. Um, so like, as long as people keep thinking like that, we, we got to try to, that's the divide. I think that's the most serious divide right now. And for this country, because that's going to be yeah. the divide that will cause a civil war. Yeah. I was thinking about that real quick uh, when you were talking about, yeah, getting these, you know, little neighborhood meetings together and i'm like visualizing that around here and it's you know majorly liberal leftist whatever Uh, Mm. so you know like to find some kind of common ground where you know like oh because it just it's so polarized like it doesn't seem like democrats want to hang out with any kind of republicans almost sometimes you know it's just like that bad so like for them to find some kind of commonality where it's that fucking important kind of just like protecting the neighborhood and yeah something like that. yeah. that's a real important thing like, like hey, we're gonna there are four minutes to like give for protection right here in the physical now 
You know, uh, we're not going to talk about anxiety ridden things that are in the future and fearful and aren't right in front of us. And, and we're not going to uh, be depressed about what's already happened in the past. But we, we're going to form this just to, for protection now because bad stuff can happen. And in talk with kid gloves, I think the way to talk to some of these people is uh, stay away from politics. Politics isn't the answer. Like we're going to protect each other. We don't need a political solution to this. We need a human solution where we protect one another. Yes. And I think if, if, if that, ha I mean, that would be the only way I could think of in your area because you guys, and we call it China Fornia. Um, it, it's bad. Like it's, like it's not bad in this state, but it's Tommy bad. Over there. What's that? Uh, it's also called California, if you will. Okay, yeah, okay, California. Yeah. Um, I'm a little luckier up north, where there's still people who recognize, you know, their rights a bit more. Good. Um, but yeah, it's scary because the um, the city folk are are infiltrating and buying out the land and the houses and getting into positions of power. So we're not going to like 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 I I'm a, I, I rent from a nice man, nice place. I'm very lucky to be where I'm at. Um, but it's a leasing company. So like a lot of these leasing companies are buying up homes left and right. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I think about in the future is, well, you're going to have to be kicked out of this house if you can't show us you've been, you know. Oh, right. Right. You know, Different right? identification requirements. Yeah. So like I, I think about that and um, it's, uh, it's there's some scary stuff. Like I'm not going to I wouldn't blow smoke up anyone's ass. This is some scary times we're living in. But at the same time, when you think about it, we are living in one of the most amazing times in human history for what's going on. Yes. Like we chose our souls decided, hey, this is our sole mission. We're here for now. Yeah. You know, no, and like when was the last time this is something like this was this serious? Probably, you know, back during ancient Egyptian times when I, I believe back then we probably got to this point of technology before we were, you know, I, I mean, again, that's just a theory. That's not back a conspiracy. ancient future, of course. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, back to, you know, just like two years ago, you were still, you, you said you still had like had a badge in your wallet or whatever, when, you know, the whole riots broke out and all that stuff. And there was this whole campaign of defunding the police and all that stuff. And how do you feel there could be some kind of bridge to with that gap of, because yeah, just seemed more of a, a cry out from the democratic side, I guess, about, you know, this, the thin blue line or whatever that <clears throat> I was in France. So I don't know much about that. And like, you know, the, the American flag with that blue stripe or whatever, I don't know yeah. what I'm about, but uh, it's just an interesting, you know, that, you know, we could, you know, like, well, Democrats, did you want to really defund the police and, you know, start up some, some real shit, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. So some... Without your guns. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, 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 there was a lot of crazy stuff going on. I mean, there was just like, they had patrols in Chicago with all these guns, like all these, like, it was crazy. There's a guy that was swords. He had swords. I'm like, he wins. He's got the swords. So like, I'm watching all this stuff and I'm like, of course, I'm not going to go down to anything like that ever. If I'm not going to be trying to talk peace. I, I, these people were being allowing themselves to be used as, as political tools, political pawns doing what they were doing. But I think personally it only takes one person at one of these riots, like at one of these big political things where people are protesting their, you know, rights to do. And instead of the cops standing on the lines or standing on, you know, stopping the protesters from whatever, all it's going to take is one or two of those cops to go out to the protesters, turn around and face everyone else. That'd be awesome. Yeah. And then get a few more to do it and mm -hmm. get a few more to do it. Now you've got all of the citizens cut and you, you are a citizen as a police officer. You need to get, go get back to being that is what I would say. And you cross over that line and turn around and watch what happens. I like that vision. Yeah. I mean, watch what happens. Like I can tell you right now, I, I've been, like I haven't had, that gives me goosebumps. Actually, you can't fake this. Um, I have been like accepted with such open arms by people in, in the anarchist community. Uh, and this is just online stuff. Can you imagine if a couple of uniformed cops, the ones with the batons and everything threw their freaking batons down and said, screw this and go walk out and turn around and face, you know, it's easy for me to say here in the comfort of my home, not out there, but, um, yeah, there was so much craziness going on back then. But I think if that happened, I think that then the upper ups would be like, 
what are we doing? Our order followers are growing consciousnesses. We can't have this now, can we? So, uh, I mean, the more that that happens, it's good that I mean, there's things going on and like there's more cops that aren't doing this stuff. Like when the sheriff in Chicago said, we're not enforcing, you're not taking gun, guns away. Um, that's a good sign. So, know. so kind of to close up here, I want to, I want to, um, hear your thoughts on this question of how, so with this vision in mind of, of everyday community people realizing that it's really up to them, that they, that everyone needs to be empowered to be um, a protector for the community to come together, right. you know, and, and be uh, protect, take this role on, right. To protect each other. How, right. how would you advise people to prepare for that? What do they need to be doing? in concrete terms um well in concrete terms like how i would be prepped <laughs> i'm kind of a prepper anyway but how i would be prepped is uh well first off there needs to be communication you should have like a monthly meeting or something so there'd be some type of communication and then how do we get a hold of each other if we need to get a hold of each other so what are what are our ways of communicating what are our ways of communicating? where is there a meeting point if the electricity goes down and the internet goes out mm -hmm you know, we'll all be in this one spot within an hour or two hours, you know, have a time frame where you're going to meet and what, what's going to happen when all of a sudden there is no communication. Mm -hmm. So that needs to be done ahead of time. So you have a place to meet. Right. And then, and then it just starts out from there as far as what you would do to, um, you know, everyone brings their own special skill set to, to that type of a group. Uh, and then it is about protecting each other and, uh, yeah, as far as like doing it in an open community, they have town hall meetings. You can go engage in the town hall meetings and try to do it in a peaceful way where we're all, you know, you're engaging the people who are the, the you know, the, the mayor and the city council or, or whatever. You're engaging them in a way where you're human beings. You're not government. We're going to just talk. And the more you engage them like that, the more maybe you can do something, at least on a smaller level. But what I've seen coming up is as it trickled down, everyone just listened <laughs> So eventually you have to actually have your own circle like uh, like Derek Bros does with the uh, um, freedom cells, uh, the freedom cells. Now, I, I wasn't about I didn't necessarily agree with eight people. I understand I like understood that whole thing, but I want like 800 people in my freedom cell. Um, I don't like the more the merrier as far as I'm concerned. Uh, like in, in that type of environment, there's going to be natural leaders in certain areas. If you actually have expertise and can teach, you're a leader, you know. Uh, right. so I, you know, you won't be a ruler. You just happen to be uh, someone who knows what they're doing in that area. You're going to be sort of a leader, right? Rather if you want to be or not. Um, yeah. Organically. <laughs> yeah. Organically. Like Mark's a leader, mm -hmm. you know, he's priest class teaching about natural law. People are going to come to him. He's a leader, whether he wants to be or not. Mm -hmm. Um, and many people don't want to be, but you, you know, there's a difference between being a leader. And that's that you're like leading in one area. Like I know this stuff, I can help with this stuff. And then that's that's where my leadership ends. And everyone kind of works together cohesively. Like when I went to Float Fest, I watched a bunch of different people get along real well. And there were all kinds of different anarchists there. There was people doing stuff there I wouldn't have done at all, but nobody was bothering anybody. Um, so people, it can be done. We can get along with one another. I think if you form a group of people that has to be outside of any type of government, um, because you can't count on them to not follow the orders from above. Cause I just, I watched it sprinkle down like a Christmas tree, you know, a reverse Christmas tree. It just came down. I, everyone, like even people at the grocery stores were order followers. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. How yeah. important would, would it be for, um, the majority of these communities to, uh, have skill in weapons, weaponry and self-defense? I, uh, I just got done training today for uh, an hour and a half with my, my two guys in striking and in grappling. Um, you know, we got this saying from the Marine Corps, uh, sweat more now, bleed less later. So train with whatever, in, with, in whatever capacity that you physically can train in. And I, I suggest being good at all ranges of, of fighting. And I talk about this in Violence and Ego also. Fighting is all about ranges. You know, you've got, you got kicking range, you got punching range, you got grappling range and you got the rifle and pistol range you got the stick range you got the knife range so like you should be trained as possible in all that stuff be healthy as possible uh i have different kinds of you know tools that you can use to protect yourself 
And I like to call them tools. I don't like to call them weapons. Yeah, yeah, I like that. And then ultimately, the main uh, weapon is our consciousness, right? As you said, you can't change right. something from the same level of consciousness. So right. everyone really needs this exposure to the natural law, the you know, what are our rights, right. defense and non-aggression principles, right? Yeah, because in a dystopian type society, and see, here's another thing that they've done over the past, you know, a couple of decades. They have us killing orcs because they're humanoids, but they're monsters. They have us killing zombies in the zombie apocalypse and the walking dead. Well, because they're humans, but they're not really humans. So they, they try to dehumanize the other side and they keep you fighting. And I think in that type of thing, you have to get a group of people to realize, you know, we're not going to just go around and take people's stuff and murder people. Mm -hmm. We're going to have higher consciousness, protect each other, not do that, try to help each other, bring somebody in, but be ready to defend yourself if others are going to come around doing that, because there's a lot of people I've talked to who think that's what they're going to go do. When if this shit hits the fan, I'm just going to steal what I need, do this, do this and do that. And I told them two things. One, it ain't going to end well for you if you think you're going to start stealing and it's going to be good for you. It's not going to end well for you. That's the first thing. And two, you need to already have some stuff and already be in a certain kind of situation, because when that stuff, if it breaks out real bad, you, it's too late if you're not already where you're at, you know, like I went out and got a Jeep that can go off road. I didn't want to wait and just go, you know, let me go see if I can steal a Jeep. You know, right. but we already have the damn Jeep to get off road with. Thank God I got one that they probably can't stop automatically because they're putting on these kill switches and vehicles and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Another, another part of preparation for, for a variety of situations that we can't really predict, but it's better to, to think ahead and, and be prepared for have it and not need it better than need yeah. it not have it. Like I, I have a couple months worth. Of, I live in Cleveland. It's 14 degrees out. I have a couple months worth of heat if the electricity goes out through, you know, propane tanks and stuff like that. So I, I would be able to sit tight. I got a couple months worth of food, a couple months worth of water. You know, I shouldn't be putting this out there. We're going to go to the dance yeah. house and show his shit. Here's what I will tell you. If electricity, if the electricity goes out and you do that little generator, keep your house dark. Mm -hmm. Use that. Use that. Like light a candle so people, someone knows. Oh, there's a candle. Oh, they're there, but they don't really have nothing. Use the generator for other things. If your house is all lit up and all the other houses are dark, yeah, yeah, it's not a good idea. Um, yeah, people it's like, like I, invitation. Like I, I, here's something I used to teach when I would teach self defense classes, and you seem like a, a very kind, caring, you know, beautiful woman. You're only about 13 meals away from turning into an animal. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would have to tell tell people. So when, when stuff hits the fan, higher consciousness is going to be the only thing that's going to bring us back and save any of us, to be honest. It's a great point. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I think prepping and talking about it is one thing in everything. And I'm, you know, listening and thinking like and visualizing because, yeah, like actually training, you know, like with the understanding the ranges of all the, the tools and all that stuff. But uh Right. Yeah, like getting together and like doing having some runs with people, like having these meetings and like, OK, like, you know, we're going to set an event and, you know, we're going to pretend, you know, there's the shit hits the fan. You know, it's not the apocalyptine of, you know, the unveiling of what no, you're, dude, you're, you're like right on. You're right on. You're, you're, you're drilling it. You're practicing it. Yeah, and, and uh, that's just going to build more unity within the community and just like that, you know, repetition and building up camaraderie and, camaraderie, yeah. like, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, not, not to yeah. dwell on the whole prepping stuff. I want to get back to the whole, you know, the whole subject and, you know, just like to f come full circle. And yeah, like it's really interesting what you mentioned with uh, police officers being like ashamed and not being able to like get the proper help and healing. And it's yeah. like folks like Leslie and I, we didn't, you know, we weren't in any kind of thing. We didn't have like those types of traumas or whatever. But, you know, we still sought for like higher learning and like some kind of mentorship through, right. you know, something called the Blue Flame Healing Arts and Occult Sciences. Because, you know, studying the occult and the hidden laws of the universe and all that is for, you know, it's you, you got to be somewhat adept to get to that level. But uh right. As far as like people on the ground level that are just like struggling on a day to day basis with their jobs, you know, I'm speaking to law enforcers kind of like directly. Um, right. 
you, there are people in the gems, like you mentioned, like Leslie, you can reach out to her. You know, she, this is you what you find somebody. Does. Yeah. You can find somebody without the drugs, without the big pharma backing them. There's no, you know, extra premium bonuses for these types of people because right. they're not fucking with the pharma stuff. So they're not getting kickbacks of that crap and they're not right. kicking your ass psychologically and physically. Right. Yeah. Not, not staying isolated. Yeah, you know, and that's what I would also tell police officers is is to to reach out and um and I know a lot of y'all because I was one of you. Sometimes you don't want to hang out with anyone who doesn't understand your 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 whatever. You know, you won't see a lot of combat vets talk about their stuff with anyone unless they're another combat vet. Um, I got them to open up to me because I've at least been shot at. I've been in some chaotic incidences and I was able to speak military at least. Mm -hmm. So they got to feel like they can have somebody to relate to. And I'm going to tell you, like, I would just say to any officer out there, there are people out here with like the two people I'm talking to right now who have empathy, will listen to you, will help. And, you know, don't be afraid to go get help and don't be afraid to leave the job. I mean, really, I, I love how it's been put. Mark's put it this way a couple of times. The universe will come to your aid. Mm -hmm. It came to mind. I'm completely blushed. So for all my griping and bitching on Facebook, I am blushed. <laughs> Trust me. I get up every morning and I'm blushed. And I say, I say aloud, I am blushed because it's very easy to get cynical. And for anybody, especially a guy like me, I was a cop for a long time. So it's very easy for me to get cynical. But, um, you know, I, I ate some humble pie back in 2012. It was concrete flavored. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I ate some more humble pie and the universe kept feeding me humble pie. So I finally got a little humble and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's funny how that works. And I think that could work with all officers, actually. You know, if you realize, if you realize if you're, if you're pissed at politicians, there's a reason why you are because they're doing stuff that's bad and I'm not delineating between which party. And if they're going to hand down orders to you that are immoral, just don't do them. If you, you know, leave the job, uh, do whatever you need to do to get out of that line of work or just don't follow the orders. Yeah. Like just say no. Yeah. I love it. The magic I mean, word. Yeah. That so, magic forgotten word. No. And then like being able to admit you were wrong or say sorry or anything like that, that's going to bring, you know, officers never want to show vulnerability. They gotta, right. We got to be, we got to be real, real tough. We can't show our heart. We can't, you know, you gotta be real tough. I found out things started opening for me when I did start showing vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah. You being know? human and connecting with people, like you said, in, in real person. Yeah. Right. You know, not, not <laughs> online, not on Facebook, not on porn sites, not on any of this stuff that is, is really easy to make disconnection easier. Yeah. You know, to make disconnection more, you know, just easier. Um, I think, getting out around people like there's times i've isolated myself on my little piece of land here and i'm doing this or doing that and i end up going to the gym people haven't seen me in a minute I'm like hey how's it going i'm like wow i feel good you know mm -hmm. i went to florida a couple years ago and uh you know i've gone a long time without touch you know the kind of marriage problems i had stuff like that there was just a lot of no human touch so i'm in florida training for about three weeks and i'm like you know i need to go find some jujitsu so i went and found a jujitsu class and after two hours of training in jiu-jitsu class and people were trying to choke me and break my limbs and this stuff and that stuff. And it's just play, but, you know, it's violent play. Um, I go back and, you know, I'm back at my little you know place where I was staying there for my little sabbatical journey of training and reading and studying. And I felt like, wow, holy cow. I just had a very human need met. Mm -hmm. Touch. And they were choking me. This isn't sexual. They were, they were trying to break something on me. And it's like, wow. It made me realize we do need connection, man. We are definitely social animals. So like every ego grows back. I got to constantly remind myself or constantly remember things, lessons I've already learned. I don't, I think that's normal um, because just this week I was, I was by myself for several days. And then when I went to the gym, I was like, yeah, I need to get out more like every day, get out until they told me I can't no more. That's another thing. Cops want to just, they'll go to work, come home, drink, go to work, yeah. come home, drink. Um, that's not healthy. Right. Right. That's not how I I so appreciate you joining us here, Dan. And um, I find this talking to you fascinating. I could keep talking and right. hearing stories, you know, and I, 
I want Maybe to one of these days we all get together on a bonfire and I'll tell you guys a bunch of stories that I wouldn't yeah. talk about on a podcast. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I kind of yeah. look forward to those days of like traveling yeah. and connecting more and more in person with, with folks. Um, but yeah, I want to applaud you for the work you're doing and for the courage that it takes to come out and, and, and share the perspective that you have. And um, thank you. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. And I thank you guys for the work you guys have done. I've watched everyone's work at one point or another. So I've seen all your guys' stuff. Everyone teaches something different, man. So it's like you get a different angle from everybody. And even if you get a little bit of the same angle, it's okay. Because I know some people have told me that, you know, I'm, I sound like Mark sometimes because I'm pissed and I swear we all should be sounding like him. But I, 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 I can kind of get it where, you you know, everyone's got their own little thing. I, I did the whole uh, concept of having the One Great Work Network where you can learn these different areas of natural law from different people in different ways. And like I've listened to uh, Will mm -hmm. Keller. And he'll, he'll teach everything Mark teaches just in a very different way. I, uh, Logan Hart also did a really nice one back in May of 2021, I think, uh, on, on Hermetic Principles I thought was awesome. So, like, you just you see these different people, you know, come together with, with different things. You guys, you got clinical experience. Mm -hmm. So, you're, you're, you're helping people through natural all that way. You've got really occult experience. There's another guy I've seen on there who's doing tarot. I do tarot. I read tarot cards, you know. And I'm a sniper. <laughs> so, wow, how can that be? It's amazing. You, you can't do both those things. Shame on you. you know, but yeah, that's what regular people do. We do different things. Yeah. You're integrating the different parts of yourself. Yes, right? it's, it's exactly what it is. It's integration. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thanks again. Um, one more plug for your work. And I want to encourage people to look you up on your website and read your books. Follow okay. Your uh, the website is spiritualanarchist93.com. And uh, my uh, latest book is Rise from Darkness, Who Are They? It was definitely heavenly. A lot of the stuff I put in there about natural law, I, I directly quoted Mark and thanked him in the book for it. It's out for free on my Facebook, or not on my Facebook, on my website. You can read it for free, download it for free. If you want to buy it, you know, um, buy it from Amazon. Maybe they'll give me the royalty. I think they've robbed me on royalties already. In fact, I know they have. But And then the other one is Violence and Ego. And it's really more applicable today than I thought it was going to be. Uh, when I first wrote it back in 2016, unfortunately. And it's a smaller read, but it's got a lot of good tactical stuff in there, what to do during an active shooting and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. We'll look forward to um, running into you again. Cool. It was good talking to you guys. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Dan. Thanks so much, brother. Yeah. All right, Thanks man. to all the listeners. Yep, yep. thank Spread you. Spread the word. Spread these videos. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll talk to you guys on Facebook. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for not unfriending me yet. All right. Talk to you later. <laughs>